We think it's working. We have no nobody watching about it. <laughs> You gotta wait for all the guests to come in. Here. Well, we're, 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 this is the podcast too. So this is this is Minor Manners. I'm Zach Osterman. He's Mike Nice. Like, there's somebody there's watching. Somebody we in have here. a somebody viewer. In here. This is gonna be um, a new format for our insider videos. Anyone who's seen them on uh, on our respective websites, we shoot those on, po- on regular podcasts too. Or do this live? well, oh, no, well, I don't know. If we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where we get up to with that. But basically, we'll do these live instead of just taping them and then uploading them. We will still upload them. Into uh, into all the content management, so they can go to our stories. We'll also take the audio from these and release it as a podcast, just like we would any other Mind Your Banners. But the idea is to <laughs> they lost, they lost <laughs> we had two 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 listeners. They're like, nope, uh, all the no. The idea is basically to just kind of you know spread the the, the media that that this sort of touches out a little bit, and obviously to do this live post game after. IU football and basketball games. We won't go long, probably no more than 10 or 15 minutes. We usually do about 10 minutes for the post-game videos. So but if readers have so questions, we'll... we're happy to sit around and talk. And well, we need we need viewers to get questions. There's three people that have right. mistakenly clicked on our link. They're like, what is going on? Let's talk about Indiana 52, Charlotte 14. You need, you need a fan or something. I know. You are. It's Scorchio. You are, it's, you are... It's, <laughs> you are uh, it's, very, it's very warm, and, and we just we just got off the field. Um, Indiana 52, Charlotte 14. Kurt Signetti, the first coach in Indiana history to start his tenure 4-0. Um, you know, it, it's funny because Signetti seemed concerned in the buildup this week about maybe a bit of a letdown, a bit of complacency. I thought at times we saw that in this game. He hit Indiana still wins by 38. They still score 52 points. Um, you know, they rushed for 222 yards and six scores. They, they still haven't committed a turnover. You know, somebody asked, apparently somebody asked uh, Biff Poggy, Charlotte's uh, head coach, about basically being the first team to score two touchdowns in one game against Indiana this season. He was like, I didn't know that. It was That was great to know. And the point is, you know, that, that Indiana is playing this well and still feeling like it's letting itself down at times. Says something about the, the, the standard of expectation that this coach, this staff, and really this roster have embraced. But I did think it was funny that Chris and Andy said maybe he went a little overboard that he didn't quite, you know, he thought the team was, he was seeing things that weren't there, that the team did. He was, that he was, wasn't that was like an interesting, what did he say? Like, uh, he, he, he said, you can speak you can that almost, into existence. Yeah. Like, it, it, oh, he, here comes a letdown. Yeah. And, and it didn't happen, obviously. But I mean, look, you know, I think they talked a lot of the players and, and Kurt about they haven't really faced much adversity. I mean, this game was 17 14, and then they scored 35 straight points and never looked back. They're facing a third-string quarterback. Uh, you know, Charlotte was dealing with some injuries. Uh, they surprisingly ran the ball well, which I thought was the only, you know, look, they'll pick apart the film and, and things. But really, the only thing that didn't happen to Indiana's liking was that Charlotte ran the ball well in that first half after yeah. being one of the worst rushing offenses in the league through three games. But, I mean, the offense, I mean, you look at it, look, Charlotte was never going to compete because they could never be able to keep up, um, you know, drive for drive with this team. Uh, Curtis Rourke. You know, the numbers don't blow off the page, but they didn't, didn't need to throw a ton. 16 to 20, 258 yards, two touchdowns, one rushing, one passing. Um, and then the, the rushing offense, over 200 yards again. Um, I mean, you know, you can go through the litany of stats. I mean, this team's just um, has, has just dominated the competition offensively. And, you know, I, I, I don't know who else to say. They're just playing with a lot of confidence, playing sharp. Curtis Work has uh, obviously made the jump, and I think there's no question about um, he was, he's, he's been ready for this moment. This veteran savvy kind of comes in on display, you know, multiple times a game. I, I, you know, I don't think you could pick apart this team much from what we saw on Saturday, just more of the same. I think, um, I guess to, to start with maybe like the, the one negative, it, it is those two touchdown drives. It is that sense that for the first time, you know, maybe all season in Indiana's defense suddenly kind of found a question it couldn't answer for a little while. You know, is it the heat? Is it, any sense of complacency? I, I do think. Well, I don't think you were there. I think you missed it. Uh, Sean Asbury said basically they were doing a lot of motions that they just hadn't seen before. So it took them a yeah. minute to sort of get. I also um, thought something else that I think you brought up is is this staff talks so much about sort of like attacking vertically at the line of scrimmage defensively, and what that means is at times you might be susceptible to teams that block zonally and are happy to kind of let you come up field and then, use and then just and then just use your momentum against you and create lanes that way. I thought there was some of that from Charlotte too. But even again, like Indiana figures that out. I mean, Charlotte in the end rushes for 137 yards in this game. 82 I think was in the first half. So, so, so I mean, like they, they clearly adjusted. Um, 
I'm looking at the numbers over here. It, it 119 pass, 137 rush, five of 13 on third downs. You know, I mean, I, I guess and they were five for eight in the first half. They didn't convert a third down after the first half. Okay, I didn't. So, so literally, no third down conversions in the second half. Um, just, a, I mean, it's sort of one of those where the competition is what it is. And we said before we looked at kind of this because it, it felt like this block of four games was kind of its own thing in this season. You had the three non-conference games and then a test against the UCLA team that it felt is, is kind of the first two weeks went on. Indiana should probably be, but it's on the road. It's the, you know, it's UCLA's first Big Ten game. It's the Rose right. Bowl, all this. And it sort of felt like we were going to – we were going to feel like we knew more about what to expect from this team after these first four games. And even given the competition, you know, there's just nothing that you can really point to and say, there's a reason why this might, you know, sort of scupper Indiana in a meaningful way. Now, maybe, maybe it will against Ohio state. I don't know, maybe it will against Michigan, but in the, in the grander possible sort of scheme, um, this is just a team that like, is playing really well in all phases. I mean, even special teams, it's not really asked to do much. Probably the biggest concern there is injuries. They got two kickoff specialists injured now. Yeah, their kickoffs haven't been great. But, I mean, look, when you're breaking down a game and you're like, man, our biggest problem is our kickoffs because we're kicking yeah. off like 800 times a game, you're probably in a good shape. Um, I think what speaks to uh, – we talked about this kind of briefly during the game, The how far this team has come. The starting duo at wide receiver last year was – was the fourth quarter backups. Donovan yeah. McCauley and EJ Williams were in on mop-up time because they couldn't get playing time in the first three quarters because the receivers are playing so – the rest of the receiving room is so deep and so talented and playing so well right now. I mean, it kind of shows you how far – what A, what coaching uh, – how much they coach these guys up. Most of these guys were transfers, uh, you know, with the exception of uh, Omar Cooper and Addison Kobe, who have gotten some run. But I mean, how well they've been integrated in the offense. I mean, I mean, look, that's coaching. I, I think that speaks to the system that you know Kurt Signetti rightly said is his. Um, and so, um, you know, you just I just think you see that you know, look from last year to this year, guys that you thought you know coming back might have some impact can't right now crack the lineup because the rest of the receiving room is playing so well. And then you look at other aspects of the offense. Indiana has already rushed for, I think, five more touchdowns this season than it did all of last season. When you talk about Indiana's pretty remarkable red zone efficiency, a lot of that is the run game. And kind of no matter who's in there, you know, Kalon Black got a rushing touchdown today. That means that all four transfer running backs have scored at least one touchdown already this season. Indiana is only something like, I think, like 55 points or 57 points away from eclipsing last season's total offensive output. I mean, you feel like you kind of get to the point where you just kind of reel off statistics because everything's just been so impressive. Yeah. You know, just been, Honestly, through, 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 I think what you do is you get to a, four weeks. You get to a point, and I think this is going to kind of bend into a little bit of what I'm writing after this. You get to a point where you feel like you should stop comparing it to what's happened before. Yeah, I mean, because, because, like it, because this is yeah. something just completely different. And we talked about in the offseason, the roster is very different. Lots of new faces. Obviously, a heavily turned over staff. Only one assistant retained, etc. But like it, it's it's kind of hard to take anything that's happened in the previous three years as any frame of reference to what this team is doing. Because even when Indiana was playing teams like this, you know, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, nobody's trying to pick on like Tom Allen or anything like that. You just, this is, it's, it's the natural sort of like, you know, chronological whatever of, of Indiana football. It wasn't like this. And it certainly wasn't like this in a big 10 road game against UCLA or, or any team comparable to that. Even when you would, you know, watch Indiana play teams it was supposed to beat, a lot of the time it would beat them, but maybe 38-13 or something like that, something where you'd, you'd feel good about it after the game, but you wouldn't look at it afterward and say, boy, the, the things you nitpick are that they gave up 80-something yards rushing in the first half and two of their kickoff specialists are hurt. Like that, right. like those are right. those are not things, regardless of who you're playing, that have been like, you know, sort of reflective of IU football in the last, again, certainly the last three years, in some of these numbers, like, you know, you're going back 10, 15, 20, even 30 years sometimes to find the last time Indiana accomplished some of these things. Again, Kurt again, he's the first IU coach ever to start 4-0. Um, and, again, listen, it's going to get harder. Now, I guess the question is sort of how much harder. Um, you just pulled up the Maryland game. They beat Villanova 38-20. to uh, Billy Edwards was really good in that game. I think that's going to be maybe the best quarterback Indiana's seen. So yeah, that's kind of what I was just about to bring up. I just want to see what they, they did. That They haven't faced sort of an imposing uh, passing offense yet. Um, you know, UCLA – 
uh, was not very impressive. Ethan Garber's, uh, you know, they get, they got a ton of pressure. They impacted that. Uh, made that that made that an issue. But um, I'm, I'm interested to see how the secondary looks when they're against maybe uh, some better athletes on the outside. Ty which Belden, is something which is something uh, something Maryland has. Ty, um, Ty but, Belden, you know, had 14 catches for 157 yards. Yeah. So, and he's probably the best uh, receiver that they'll face this you know in this this block of this first month. Um, so I think that'll, you know, D'Angelo. Gray, there's a good player too. Yeah, uh, D'Angelo Pons, uh, who was out the first half with targeting suspension. Uh, interested to see how he matches up against a guy like Felton, see how the secondary kind of holds up. Because, um, you know, we talked about the challenge escalates now. Um, and, and so you sort of see, you want to see, you know, there's some things I'm interested in seeing. You know, can the offense keep it up against a sort of Big Ten, uh, you know, defensive line multiple weeks in a row, um, of things of that nature. Um, but I do think this first four weeks has built confidence that, you know, this wasn't – I don't think what we saw was an aberration. You know, they, they might not score 50 points a game kind of in the next four weeks, but I do think that they've, um, you know, proven to they've, – they've answered a lot of the questions that you had kind of before the season. Would the JMU guys and a lot of the transfers they had from lower levels be able to have an impact in the game? And I think the answer is basically across the board, yeah. Now they had some depth questions, but you saw guys, I pointed this out in my recap, like Sam West stepping in as the backup tight end. Um, you know, Kalon Black's the third running back, and, you know, he was really good today. And so you kind of see them built a little bit of depth at places. Um, you know, I don't think there's as much sort of questions about any of their talent that, you know, those transfers. I mean, I just, they've done really well through these four weeks. And, and I think, you know, Indiana's deserving. You know, they got some recognition in the AP poll, the coaches poll. And I think that's only going to continue here in the next, you know, ten days before that Maryland game, or seven days. I think uh, I think if they beat Maryland, more. they'll be ranked. They have to. Yeah, yeah I think I, I, think, I think if they beat Maryland, they'll be ranked. I think the last thing we should talk about is Curtis Rourke, uh, because it does. Even if there have been times when almost Indiana has not had to ask too much of him, this was kind of another one of those games because the ground game was working so well, the defense was playing so well. Through four games now at Indiana, he's over a thousand yards of total offense. If you include the run in the pass, he's got ten total touchdowns. Yeah, he's on pace he's, to be, uh, for three thousand yards and will be the fourth three thousand yard passer in IU history, which is crazy. Yeah, and he's um, he's got the highest quarterback rating of his career thus far in a single season. If you uh, sort of subscribe to ESPN's numbers on that, again, like you talked about today, he wasn't prolific, but it was because he didn't have to be but, sixteen to twenty. I mean, like his completion percentages have been good. I think the quarterback more than anybody else in the offense is going to be pivotal to, you know, a team that's just not turning the ball over, which Indiana literally hasn't through four games. I don't think he took a sack today. I think um, uh, David yeah, Jackson, Jackson got Jackson sacked Jackson. once. And that Rourke, was, I, Rourke hasn't taken a sack. I don't know if the you FIU saw the game. Uh, it was, they, they, were, they hadn't gone three games without giving up a sack since 2013, 2012-2013, the first game of the stat season. Last, first, last game of that. 12 season and the first two games of 13 hadn't done it in a single season since 2001. So that's the last time they've gone three games without sack. They almost did it tonight. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think they would have if they had kept working. There. No, no. I mean, because again, I mean, like he scrambled a little bit more today and he basically just said, Hey, that's what was, that was what was there. So I just took it Four carries 32 yards and a touchdown. He, he kind of, I think even he chuckled a little bit at like that awkward sort of way he tried yeah, to protect himself right. he just when sort he got of slumbered down. Into, uh, but you know, I mean, he's not somebody that when you see him in the open field. I remember pointing out to you in the preseason he had 11 rushing touchdowns at Iowa. When you see him get out in an open field, I, or oh, excuse me, thank you. <laughs> you know, it, it, one of those Big Ten states. They're just um, beating teams that aren't even playing. That's how good they. Are. But in, you know, in his in his career at Ohio, he had something like 700 rushing yards and 11 touchdowns. So it's not like he, he can't can move. No, he do can it. move. He's, he's not. He is not a statue passer that every once in a while you think like, oh boy, here he goes. It's more just kind of. And I mean, I even asked him about this after the game. I said, just kind of, how important is it in your mind to just put that on film so that like the next defensive coordinator says we can't just leave the middle of the field wide open with with no contain because he can run for nine yards in a first down or whatever. Well, He's just been, you know, so much of Indiana's start has been built around this offense, how many points they're scoring, how efficiently they're doing it. You know, they were coming in today, into today anyway, the best fourth down team or third down team in the Big Ten. They are the most prolific red zone team in the Big Ten. They have not committed a turnover. They're, again, they're, they're, again, they're this averaging more than 50 points per game. And if there's one person that, like, is at the center of that the most, it's it's, it is. is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two things that stood out about Rourke's day, four or five on passes of 15 yards plus. 
And he, he had, had some, two, he had some really pretty two, balls. So two balls to uh, Miles Price were basically like he had a turn and it was just like in his hands. Yeah. Uh, and Price said, like, look, that's pretty easy football, right? Like, yeah. I mean, so it was like, that's easy. Uh, so those throws, um, you know, you put that on film when you only complete 16 passes and four of them are for 15 plus yards, dangerous offense down the field. Second um, thing was the play. You know, Kurt Zagnetti talked a lot about his veteran savvy, his experience, and what that brings. The play in the red zone, third down, nothing's up. You know, actually good coverage for one of the few times of the day. Yeah. He extends the play, kind of looking, just rolling out uh, to his right, sees clear pass interference on Zach Horton, throws the ball at him, and because the, you know, the official's going to have to call it, draws the penalty, press set down, touchdown the next night. Yeah. That's a, that's a better quarterback. And, and that's and, little and stuff that's, that, like, you don't – It does not get himself just, in the box for. And you don't even necessarily statue. see it, like, yeah. on, you know. It doesn't occur to you necessarily. It didn't occur to me until you pointed it out, yeah. like, that he was he was looking for the pass interference penalty, but it is. because. But And he also had to extend that play to make that happen because, I, yeah. I mean, he could have thrown it away earlier. Uh, but he was – look, he, he, had, he keeps his eyes downfield. And, and I think Kurt mentioned that earlier in the week, that that's kind of been one of the more impressive things he saw. That was kind of the key to the third down success last week. Uh, again today they had third down success, but he was in just because he's look he, he's 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 a veteran. He knows what he's doing. He's keeping his eyes downfield, trying to make things happen, but doesn't force the ball at the same time. And that was kind of a moment that stuck out to me. That look, it wasn't a great, you know, it wasn't something that you'll talk about maybe Monday, but it's just those moments stack up, um, and, and I think are going to matter when you face you know, the Maryland, the Brasses of the world. When the, you know, Brass got a freshman quarterback, you have a veteran quarterback that's been in these moments, and I think those those things will, will, will matter down the line. And he has 4-0, uh, 1-0 in the Big Ten. I, I, the last thing or the, 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 the question you just have for the next seven days is, what does the crowd look like against Maryland? What that was just a that, 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 you know, he, he didn't mention the crowd today, but the second half again. It, it, it about, cleared out. There was about 10 fans. In the, in the to, to be fair, like, it was roasting hot today, and it was – You are, I think you are so kind. I think – I see, I think the crowd stuck when around until they got the their south. first – who has seen the crowds in Auburn know, and, and no I've been heat, telling people and, and no heat, people. but no, you're giving them excuses. There's no at Kurt Zanetti, standard doesn't change. It's 150 degrees. And the question is whether degrees. the question is, I'm gonna be a little worried if it's 150 degrees. I was in Vegas this summer and it reached 122. So I mean it, it got it we're, go, we're going there. Yeah. Is what you're saying? No, we, we should next year with the bull for Las Vegas. <laughs> was, was anyone watching a football game outside when you when you were in Vegas? Um the question I think is. What will the crowd look like? What will the atmosphere be? Obviously, how will Indiana play to it? Like, in a way, I, I almost wonder if there would be more value in Maryland being difficult, the place being full, everybody sticking around and winning than just another, like, 40 to 11 win in the sense that there would be almost kind of a, a – I think the crowd needs to understand what it can do for – Well, yeah, because, I mean, you saw the third downs – you know, it's like they do the get up on third down, and it's like one guy wearing a flag. <laughs> it's not the most imposing atmosphere. I'm not not going to look. I mean, I, they've done enough now where I think you can buy in a little bit. You know, I, I, think, I, know you fans, buy, I think you buy in a lot, frankly. Uh, but I'm saying from a bowl game with eight but I'm saying, you know, if fans were sort of uh, we've been through this before, I, I think you can buy in. But you better do it quick because you know these jobs are going to open up. We don't know what happens. Oh, right? well, we're gonna we're not gonna start the speculation today. No, He's I'm Mike teasing. Nisley. I'm teasing. I'm Zach. Austin. We didn't get any questions. Next time we need somebody questions. did call us the best beat writer duo in college football. I wasn't gonna point that. That was nice. gonna point well. You, I wasn't gonna point that. There's not people here. Type us a question. No, we're no, no, no. We're gonna we'll, no. We'll, why we, not? You gotta me? walk before you can run. This has been my demand. What they didn't game. see was it you taking 25 minutes to get this set up. It was like 10 minutes. It was like 10 minutes. I had to change a password. I was, I was That's keeping it. time. Uh, he's Mike Nines. Like I'm Zach Osterman. This has been my Banner's post game for Indiana 52, Charlotte 14. We'll be back sometime midweek with the customary podcast as we do. We'll probably talk a little bit. I think about basketball media day. We really haven't touched on that yet, but it's probably worth talking a little bit about that as well. But a big build up, obviously, to. Uh, the Maryland game. Until then, for the Indianapolis Star, we'll be here at all times. Thanks so much for watching, listening, however you consume this. We will talk to you soon.